Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is Star Parodi. She is a keyboardist and composer. I guess that's the best way to describe you, you've been You've done so many different things. I guess that's sort of the, the most generic way of describing guess, your, what you do, right? Do we want to be generic? <laughs> okay, let's not be generic. Well, let's spend about 20 minutes on an introduction. No, well, you know what? I mean, it's so funny. It's, I think, a, a, a good life. My, my husband always says a good life is seven dogs long. <laughs> that's and, about right. And I mean, to mm-hmm. me... Being able to do a lot of different things has been really fulfilling and and creative. So, you're speaking so in my, yes, yeah, exactly. Keyboardist, composer, pianist, mm-hmm. producer. So let's start with just some some background. I mean, okay. Obviously, I know you're an LA native. I Are am. you from a musical family as well? My um, my grandfather uh, played accordion and wrote polkas in Italy. I guess that qualifies as music. <laughs> no, oh, oh. <laughs> um, but other than that, uh, not really. Parents were not musical. Um, you know, it's so funny. Uh, I was doing a session one time, and my mom happened to be there, and she said to me, she's a she was a holistic doctor. She said, "Oh, the trumpet player is playing a D above high C," and I went, "What?" <laughs> She had perfect pitch, and I never knew it. So she played uh, music as a kid, but mm-hmm. became more into holistic health and alternative medicine and stuff. But so she got a real job. She got a real job. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but you know, mm-hmm. not not anybody of note. So classically trained. Uh, classical jazz, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which are very very close in so yeah. many ways. Well, yeah. Well, if you take apart like a Bach invention. Mm-hmm. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Two five two five two five two five. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, give me a little bit of the early arc. Were you a, a rocker kid? I mean, were you in bands and stuff like that? Or um, early arc was I was pretty, uh, I guess, um, rebellious. Really. <laughs> A little bit, um, yeah. I'm shocked. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I didn't. What did that look like? It didn't. It wasn't pretty. Uh-huh. It wasn't pretty. Okay. It was. It was a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, like a lot of kids, I felt very misunderstood, and uh, and so I, music was really what kind of saved me, and I got into it relatively late, in around 14 years old. I started to play the piano. Wow. Um, when I went to uh, a party with, that I probably shouldn't have been at when I was about 15, uh, <laughs> I know, uh, at a college, this I sat down to play. They they had a Fender Rhodes there, and I sat down to uh, play a couple chords because that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. And this guy showed me something, and I picked it up, and he said, "You you picked that up really quickly. You should play piano." And I went, "Oh, you know." And, and at age 14, <laughs> somebody says, you should, and you say, yeah. Yeah, that's a really mm-hmm. good idea. Uh-huh. But I just always, I, I felt like piano and music just scored my life. It grounded me. Uh-huh. Um, it made me feel, you know, alive. So so I just dove in. Um, I got accepted to Interlaken, uh, which is a, a high school for the performing arts. Yeah. When I was a senior, I went there. And you must have picked it up quickly then. I did. Mm-hmm. Well, I got in for creative writing and piano. Uh-huh. Um, and then I just practiced basically seven, eight hours a day from then on. <laughs> so you're a writer as well? Well, I mean, that's just more of a hobby. Okay. That's more okay. of a hobby. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, I, um, I went to Interlaken, came back, uh, went to Orange Coast College for a couple of years, and during that time started gigging and playing with as many people as I could. And, the, you know, as they say, find the very best people that you can play with and of learn course. from them. Be, and the, I, be the worst person be in the, the wor- band. I yes. was, I was yeah. the worst person in the band, you know. But I had a lot of uh, ambition and, and heart and willing, willingness to learn, you know. So, um, so I have a, a good story. I had a teacher at UCLA, and this was when I was still a, a teenager. And I went to my lesson, and I was supposed to play a Haydn sonata, 
and I had not practiced it because I'd been going, you know, to churches and learning yes solo, you know, <laughs> with like Quinn solos and everything uh, like in Palmer, right. whatever. And I went and I was just, you know, I was in tears. I couldn't play it. I hadn't practiced it. I didn't like it, you know. Yeah. I was like, what am I doing? And anyway. Haydn's hard to like. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 So anyway, this this teacher, Howard Richmond was his name, um, he had, he just had this incredible way and sense of connecting with people. So I'm in tears. I've told him of some health issues, like, I think I might have a brain tumor. I think I, I, I don't know, I can't think, you know, I didn't learn it. I'm sorry, you know. I didn't do my homework because I'm going to die. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, yeah. literally I was telling him stuff like that. Of course. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he just quietly sat down, took a piece of score paper, and wrote a poem that he made up. Uh, right then and there, about the rain and the dark clouds and the the the, the wind blowing and and the night coming and the sunrise and he just wrote this very simple poem, very descriptive, and he sat it in front of me at the piano and he goes, "All right, then play that." Interesting. And I sat there and I looked at the poem, and I thought, "Okay," and I closed my eyes and I started trying to visualize what was happening in the poem, and I started to improvise. Let me guess, minor chords. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? I was like all over the place, you uh, know? But, but it really awakened this visual sense of music in me. And I'll just be forever grateful to him for that. So every wow. week after that, it was, you know, the Haydn, um, but it was also a poem. Mm -hmm. It was also play that. Cool. So <laughs> to digress a little bit, it was also kind of strange being a girl in the band in those days, wasn't it? Pretty weird. Yeah? Yeah. What was well, that like? Um, you know, it, it was funny. Uh, when I came back from Interlochen, and I mean, I was just, I think, probably 19 or 20. I had gone to Orange Coast College for a year, and I was living on my own uh, in Studio City. And I get this call from somebody of fame and the, the television show, and they mm -hmm. said, do you think anyone would believe that a girl could play the keyboards? <laughs> well, you know, they're genetically indisposed to that. You know? I mean. <laughs> and I said, yes, I, I, I think that somebody would believe it. So they said, come on in, you know, we want to talk to you. And so I ended up being a sideline musician on Fame, but I ended up also writing some some songs for some of the actors with Maureen Crow, who wow. got uh -huh. her start there too. She was the music supervisor. Mm -hmm. And then I did some, you know, I played in the fame band, the live band. and um, So you had a pretty safe environment in that sense. Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, yeah. they were. I mean, supportive were, in that sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you know what? I, I think it's always, you know, how hard are you willing to work? Sure. How much are you willing to put in? Um, after that, I, you know, I started, I started gigging, I played with Marilyn McCoo. Gail Dietrich was the MD on that, and uh -huh. she was amazing. Vanessa Brown played percussion in that band. So, okay, so it was a well-balanced so band. So it was a well-balanced band, yeah. um, and a really cool band. And then right after that, I got a job with George Howard. And George Howard, I was the only girl. <laughs> okay, now, now <clears throat> let's back up a moment here, because... Okay. It almost sounds like these things just fell in your lap, and I know oh, no. that doesn't happen. No, no, no. So there is a large faction of people who watch these shows who are younger, and often they ask me questions like, how do I get those first breaks and whatnot? Now, you just skipped over all of the... All of the ten years to the t to the ten year overnight success thing, right? Yeah, yeah. What was what were the early days like in terms of gigging and finding these? Because obviously you had to be working to find these opportunities. They didn't just fall in your lap. Right. No, you talk were so to me a little right bit up. about that. I'm so glad you brought that up because I didn't mean to skip over that. Oh no, no, no. But um, I, but I just think that's an of... important detail. Yeah. Um, so from about fifteen on, I practiced about seven or eight hours a day. Slacker. <clears throat> Till, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I... And it didn't feel like practice at all. You loved it, right? I loved it. Yep. I mm -hmm. loved every minute of it. I, I, um, I 
tried to jam with every single person that would play with me, you know. I, I looked in at the time, I think it was the recycler or on, you know, on, mm -hmm. on message boards or whatever. Music connection. Music yeah, connection. Uh -huh. Wanted. Keyboard player. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. I'll do it. You know, I didn't care how much it paid. Um, I, I played in top 40 bands six, seven nights a week. And that's great education. Oh, my gosh. I played in a few of them, too. And just having to learn those parts. Yeah. It's because what it does it, also is... It starts you thinking critically of how to break down certain orchestrations and, yes. and how to, you know, what is this doing while that's doing that? Mm -hmm. And the big picture kind of feel for yeah. a lot of these tracks. Also production, you know, yeah. and yeah. sound, sonic palettes, like groove, you know. It was so funny. I was playing in a, in a gospel band with actually, again, I really lucked out meeting a lot of people through fame uh -huh. and so I was playing with a lot of people that I had met through there and a couple of the guys were from Earth, Wind & Fire. I mean I was really playing with some good people oh. but there was this one guy and he said and again I was the only girl in the band and you know we were playing all groove stuff and he said I want you to come over I want you to meet somebody. I, I said okay. He said I really want to share with you how to play in the pocket. <laughs> because <laughs> you are not doing it and okay so I come over to his apartment and he said I want you to meet Craig sitting on his kitchen table is a drum machine uh -huh. that he has named Craig and he taught me so much about playing like where the beat is where the pocket is where yep. to, where behind where you know yep. everything he showed me so much so there were so many people along the way that were like my brothers mm -hmm. that really helped me and shared their knowledge with me and you know we didn't have mentors really like we do now right now uh there's so many people that have mentorships with composers with with musicians and we didn't call then, them mentorships then. We didn't yeah. call it mentorships, yeah. but in a way it was it was so deep. It was even more sure. more like a mentorship because it was somebody not necessarily consciously being asked, but just wanting to say, "Hey, I want I want to see you do good. I want to play with you. I want you to I want you to realize your dreams, you know. So here it is." But there's another point there that I think is interesting too, which is you started out in this classical mode and I think one of the delineations, one of the real strong delineations to me between classical and jazz, even though they are brethren, is improvisation. Right. I know so many classically trained musicians who can't jam, who can't just, you know, you say, take it, you know, take, take eight bars, you know, and they can't. Mm -hmm. They just can't, even if they can, they can't. Yeah. You know, they can't groove. And... That, I think, is obviously something that you learned and something that must have been incredibly valuable. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Mm. Yes, it was incredibly valuable. And, and then just being on the road, having an opportunity mm. to play with different people. So And learning how to hang. Lear learning how to hang. Because that's another thing about being on the road. Learning how to seriously hang. You can be the hang. best musician in the world, but if you're an asshole, you are not going to be keeping the gig. So true. Yeah. So true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, learning how to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, and that's so funny, too, because I have a, um, I have one phrase that always comes up for me when I work with younger students, and I teach them about recording mm -hmm. and studio demeanor. What I say uh, quite often is, I can teach you how to work a compressor, but I can't teach you when to keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. And there are so many of those instances where you just have to learn those things. And sometimes you learn them the hard way. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But by keeping your mouth shut, or my mouth shut, I mean more um, taking everything at face value, not being judgmental, mm -hmm. um, not yeah. talking about people. If somebody talks about somebody, changing the conversation. Oh, because, so all that gossip we said before we can. <laughs> I know, I know. No, I, I, I mean, gossip just, it, it, it just kind of, I don't know. It's pernicious. It's mm. pernicious. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty awful, and it makes people feel bad. So yeah. Yeah. it's it's the best way to avoid 
you know, not being able to hang. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's but true. I was telling my daughter the other day, we did have like a mustard fight in a really nice hotel one time. Ooh. <laughs> so that's like, ooh, you know. <laughs> and I'm sure there's, you know, a lot of stories that I won't be able to say. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. We all have those stories we that we can't tell. We all have those stories. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll share those off camera. We'll share those off, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. but, so, but I just wanted to say mm -hmm. and to really encourage people who are coming up because there's so many amazing, fulfilling things you can do in music. And sometimes if you just pick one path and you close yourself off to everything else, if that doesn't work out, there, I just always feel like it's good to be open because the yes. best things happened to me that came kind of out of the blue when I said yes. Well, and to your point, I have often had this conversation with people where we, you know, you, you just mentioned earlier about a good career being seven dogs long. Right. Or good now, life. Yes, a good life. Well, <laughs> and, and to that to that end, a career as well, mm -hmm. because I felt, I still feel that I've been through at least a dozen careers. Yeah. You know, and I think part of that is, as you say, being open. I think also part of it is not pigeonholing yourself. You know, mm -hmm. when we're when we're much younger, we have this vision of this is what we're gonna do. We don't see all this stuff. And then, you know, you turn around years later and you realize, I'm nowhere near where I expected to be at this point in my life. Yeah. And yet, you know, you've done all, the, all of these other things and one thing has led to another or one connection has led to another. And things that you never imagined would be part of your career end up being part of your career and big parts of it. And I think that's really... That, that's exactly what you're talking about there, the whole idea of being really open to whatever tangential things come up yes. that you might not expect would be of value to you. Yeah, with gratitude, with humility, uh -huh. you know, um, and... And with awareness. And with awareness. Just being and present. The yeah. small steps, yeah. you know. Yeah. I remember when I was in that 15-year-old mode, I had a list of things I wanted to do, you know. Oh, you were one of those. I was, <laughs> I was one of those, <laughs> which I think is really good to mm -hmm. make a list of sure. what is it. And, you know, I had the small steps, and, and then I had, you know, I want to play for millions of people because at that time I hadn't even thought about being a composer, you know. And so I envisioned myself somehow, even though I couldn't sing, which was a real drawback because, <laughs> you know, you can't, you know, there's very few instrumentalists that, that really, you know, get to, get to experience that right. multi-arena, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, everybody's holding the lighter up <laughs> only, or now the phone. Only when you're singing the right lyrics. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. um, but in a way, when I was hired on the Arsenio Hall show, I was playing for millions of people. So my yes. dream came true, but in a completely different way than I had imagined. Yes, exactly. So let I want to come back to that. Okay. But again, that came through, no doubt, some connection that you hadn't expected through some sort of tangential thing. But prior to that, did you, you obviously envisioned yourself in a band how did that start changing for you? Did you start doing sessions? Did you start writing with people? What was it that sort of changed your perspective and broadened that, that tunnel vision view of, I'm going to be a rock star? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I ever wanted to be a rock star. Maybe I did. Yeah, we all did. <laughs> we Come all on. Did. We, we all, all went did. through that, even if it was only for five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I always wrote songs. Mm. And I always heard music in my head and still do, all the time. I do now, although this light is buzzing and it's like, oh <laughs> no. Um, but what key is it buzzing? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just interesting because um, I'm just trying to think of what, there wasn't really a, a definitive shift. Oh, I'm gonna start writing. I was playing with ba in bands, mostly fusion bands, soul bands, jazz bands. Mm -hmm. I had my own band. I wrote my own music. Mm -hmm. So we played uh, for people who in LA, we, at the Lighthouse and at... Um, oh, I remember the Lighthouse. The Lighthouse, mm -hmm. Manhattan Jazz, yeah. Le Cafe, uh -huh. all, those, all those places. Uh -huh. So 
that was really fun and gave me a chance to really stretch out and play and also have great players come mm -hmm. and, and yeah. play. And a friend of mine asked me to make a tape with him, a cassette, of some songs that he was, or of some, of some instrumental music that he was going to submit to some composers to see if they might want you know, at the time it was ghostwriting. Now it's on the team. Right. You know, of course. And and so we made this tape and we sent it to a couple of people and they they both hired us. Um, one of them was uh, uh, for some cartoons, some cartoon music that did some stuff like for that. Uh -huh. And the other one was Mike Post. And Mike Post was a you know is an incredibly prolific and successful. An yeah television writer. Yes. Um, he also, I think he produced Classical Gas. I think he did. I and did not know that. Yeah, really? Yeah. I oh, think wow. he did. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and Mason he, Williams. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. He, he's done so much stuff. Anyway, he really liked the idea of having me on his team. So I was a writer for him uh, for maybe eight of his 13 shows. <laughs> wow. And um, So that opened up a completely different perspective for completely, you, Completely, because we had an orchestra a couple times a week. So, so now I want to segue to that a little bit, because <laughs> there is a completely different mindset when you're writing for visuals, as opposed to when you're just writing, you know, jazz or a jam and or whatever. And not if you have the pictures in your head. So I always had the pictures in my head. And, and that is what I wanted to bring up because um, it was interesting. I had a conversation recently with Mark Rubel, who uh, works over at Blackbird. Mm -hmm. And Mark mentioned something. We, we, we got off topic a little bit. We're both <laughs> Kurosawa Imagine. fans. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. But we're both Kurosawa fans. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you know, to me, when I'm envisioning an arrangement or a mix, I try to think about it in cinematic terms. Mm, you know, love that. and. So, you know, the guitar is a character. Where is that character? Where is the vocalist? What are they doing? What role are they in? What, what's the setting? And I think that, in a way, really makes sense when you're composing for visuals because you can complete that puzzle a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, I love that he yeah. thinks that way. Mm -hmm. That's it's really cool. And, and I think that probably did a lot for you in terms of being able to bridge that whole... You know, because the other thing about composing for visuals, whether it's games or scores or whatever, when we write songs, they're very, for the most part, formulaic, especially pop songs, you know, uh, Abacab or whatever, whatever format you're using. There is a, there's a concept there. It's a three-minute movie. Mm -hmm. And there are some brilliant, brilliant pop songs and well, songs in general that are literally, lyrically, a three-minute movie. You know, some of, some of the greatest songwriters we know, you know, there's a story that is told. Yes. And it's told within the first verse. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a setting in the first verse, and by the time you've gone to the end of the song, you have literally been drawn into an experience yeah. and a movie. That you want to relive over and over. Right, exactly. Whereas when you're writing for picture, there's no real boundaries and restrictions other than I'm a part of this entire package here. Right. And in that sense, does it not free you up to be able to not have to conform to those kind of formats? Hmm. Or does it complicate things? <laughs> well, or both? I would say it's a different kind of a thing mm -hmm. because it's a collaboration. Just like writing a song with somebody is yeah. a collaboration. Sure. You're collaborating with the director and their vision and the actors and the scene. And you have the ability with what you put on at the, because music is last. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Usually. Usually. Um, you have the, the ability to shape it in many different ways. And oh, yeah. You can make an entire difference just by what you put up there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So in that way, it's very powerful. And it's all that, you know, all that much more important to mm -hmm. really understand the vision of the director and the, the vision of the whole project. Mm -hmm. Because you, you don't want to take it in a direction, <laughs> in, in a direction that it's not meant to go in. Sure. 
and and you don't want to make the audience feel manipulated. And and often the director doesn't really know what direction they want to take it, and you're giving them options. Right, exactly. And then they see it and they go, "Oh, I love this," or "This is not what I want." Right. And or I hadn't thought of that. Or I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. And and yeah. also, so many times people don't feel like they can speak the language of music, and so it's so important to be able to put them at ease and try to develop a language together, you know? And that comes down to having a vocabulary, not just a musical vocabulary, but a verbal vocabulary too, and being able to bridge those. Right. You know, I've, I've told this before, but I was in a session once with a band and the guitarist asked me if I could make his guitar sound a little more brown. Mm -hmm. And being able to mm -hmm. bridge those concepts and be able to understand what they're asking for. Brown meaning Even maybe earthy, warmer. warmer. Yeah, exactly. It mm -hmm. was an EQ setting, you know. Yeah, but, but, yeah. But the idea of being able to sort of read people's mind mm -hmm. to a certain extent and understand what it is they're asking for or maybe not asking for. Right. That, I think, is the challenge, right? Or if somebody says, I don't like this, it could be just one instrument that they don't like the sound mm -hmm. of and and so if you or change everything, change, or, or a tempo, yeah. and they say, oh, I didn't want you to change the whole thing. I just didn't like that one part, yeah. you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. But really being able to, to communicate on both a verbal and a nonverbal mm -hmm. level, yeah. I think is what really makes a difference there. Yeah, it's and so I think true. That's, that is part of getting the gig, keeping the gig, and everything in between, isn't it? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So let's let's go back to the whole Arsenio oh. thing. Yeah, let's take let's take another hairpin <laughs> turn here. I, I I tend to do this, you know. I'm probably not the best interviewer that no, way. No, you're you know, so great. I love this. I I know that there again, this could not have been just, you know, you're 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 in Ralph's one day and Arsenio Hall walks up and says, "Hey, join my band." No. So <laughs> um, again, this comes down to working, networking. And this is, again, something that I think is really important and valuable, especially to younger people coming into the industry, understanding what networking is and what it's not. Uh -huh. And in particular, what it's not. Because I've run into so many people who are, shall I say, less than sincere. Oh. <laughs> to me, and it goes back to what we were just talking about, about being a good hang, I think it comes down to being genuine mm -hmm. and really treating people the golden rule, you know, treat people like you want to be treated. And isn't that what opens a lot of those doors? I think so. I think that when you, when there's somebody that you really want to meet, the more that you can know about that person is very helpful. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of emails from people um, and if somebody writes me and they say, hey, I, here's, I, I really want you to help me. <laughs> right, right. I, I'm, I'm a composer, and I really, I really want you to help me, and here's what I've done. Here's, here's five links or a download, you know. of, of Delete. <laughs> and, and then, you know, mm -hmm. that's it. I, I'm not as apt to, sure. to quickly respond to that person as somebody who says, I listened to some of your music, this piece in particular really touched me. Mm -hmm. I fought, you know, I read about you. Is there any way that we could, that I could, you know, we could talk on the phone or have a tea or something? Right. That's the person I would say, oh, I really want to talk to them. So I really want to help every, you know, I want to yeah. help as many people as I can. Yeah. And I think that's really true. You know, that's, um, and it goes down to the same principle that, uh, that we used to talk about, you know, a lot of the uh, younger people coming into the industry, their first question is, when's the best time to give my tape to the, to the producer? <laughs> you know, and the answer is never, of course. You know, there, is a, there is an unspoken rule that says that if you want to work with people, if you want to get along with people, approach them genuinely, approach them as a peer. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that's so valuable, and I'm sure that's what opened a lot of doors for you as well. Yeah. I I agree with you. I, I mean, as I look back, I feel like I'm always looking forward. It's so funny. I'm, you know, at this stage in my life, I feel like I'm just getting started because yep. 
life has been so nonlinear for me. And I've, I, it's so funny, I, I know this piccolo player who said, uh, for them in an orchestra, life is oceans of boredom with islands of terror. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like touring. Which is like, it's so, so, it's so, so apropos for piccolo, yeah. but it is for life too. Mm -hmm. I went through a period of kind of slowing down when I got, had my daughter. And she was a young child, and I wanted to spend a lot of time with her. Mm -hmm. And then it's just been it's been like this, but it's all has been really interesting. I just feel like talking about the Arsenio Hall show. Before that, I was on another talk show, a local talk show with a weatherman here called Fritz Coleman. I know Fritz Coleman, yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. NBC. Everybody knows Fritz. Oh, he was so awesome. And uh -huh. he was also a stand-up comedian. Right. And NBC gave him its own show. And I was the band leader and the only... Uh, really? I was the only person in the band. <laughs> and they had me on a forklift <laughs> in the air with a bunch of keyboards around me. And I had all these songs programmed, and I played these bumpers in and out. And it was a very short-lived show, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Of course. But it, I'm, I'm still stuck <laughs> on the idea of I was the band leader. I was the only person in the band. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, so, a department of one. Yes, yes. I was mm -hmm. the department of one. Um, but that gave me some experience also working on fame, had given uh -huh. me some experience playing and. By the time that I was in the Arsenio show, I had been on the road with George Howard and Marilyn McCoo and Phil Kagey, uh, some gospel bands as well, and played until my fingers bled with, uh -huh. with uh, top 40 bands and every jazz band, everything. Yeah. You know, so when, when I was, when I auditioned. That's getting that vocabulary. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was ready. Mm -hmm. And I was ready to jump in and I was really I had no, I think none of us really knew what we were getting into. Well, and that's interesting also because I think Arsenio that era the late night talk show was still a thing. It's no longer really a thing. It's no longer. I mean, we still have them, mm -hmm. but I don't think they moved the needle as much as they did years ago. Oh, his and, show. Oh yeah. my gosh. If you if you were a band that broke, they there's so Absolutely. many bands that yeah. broke on that show. Yeah, exactly. Mariah Carey did her very first television appearance. Tears for Fears. Um, Melissa Etheridge was on the show and kind of uh, gained notoriety on, on that show. She was a really good friend of the of the director, Sandy uh -huh. Fullerton. Um, so many people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just so many people because got their back start. then late night talk shows were really the way the, the way that a lot of artists broke. Yes. Um, Radiohead. Yeah. Well and, and in fact um, our mutual friend Lily Hayden. Love her. I know she did an appearance on Jay Leno at one point and she said that was a, a big break for her as well. I think at a certain point those were the the gigs that you really wanted to have. Millions of people watched every exactly. night. Exactly. Yeah. And the record sales from what I was told just went through the roof after sure. there was a performance on our on sure. our show. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So how was that for you in in breaking your career? Obviously that must have been a big a big boost for you as well. It was a it was Again, a shift. It was a completely unexpected shift. What was great about it was it allowed me to um, to not have to go on the road mm -hmm. anymore, which I hadn't been doing for. I wasn't a road dog, you know. I hadn't been doing it for a long time, but it allowed me to stay in town and write uh -huh. in the day for film and and for I got into doing movie trailers at the time. So was this your first? I mean, was this? Part of that whole transition? This was kind of part of the transition. This was the transition of, okay, I'm not going out on the road. I have a steady gig for six years. I'm in town. I go at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And so from 9, 8, 7 in the morning till then, mm -hmm. I can write. And then I can write when I come home. And I, I had kind of a, a schedule, which is so unusual. Yeah. Right? Wow. I'd never had that before. <laughs> Structure. Structure, never, and, and never since, actually, uh -huh. either. It was just kind of an amazing, it was an amazing band. Mm -hmm. I loved every single person in the band. We, we loved playing together. We, 
we practiced. Uh, Chuck Morris and I, who was the drummer, he and I would sit during our break and we'd tap out rhythms together till my, like, I'd tap on my legs until they were blue, you know, <laughs> paradel, you know, uh, we were coming up with, so that yep. we could just look at each other and go into kind of a percussive keyboard drum rhythm together. Um, you know, we were just really close. The whole, the whole crew, the whole, the whole group was really close. And we're still, so many of us are in touch and close. One of the things that I think is interesting about that is, and again, we'll go back to the whole idea of how you learned. There is this give and take when you play with live musicians. And sadly, a lot of that has been lost. And yeah. I, you know, when I, when I taught college, one of the things that really shocked me was that well, first of all, I was struck by the fact that none of them remembered anything be before the turn of the century. <laughs> but <clears throat> my first question to a lot of them was, you know, tell me about yourself. And they would all say, well, I want to make beats. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, so how many of you were actually, have actually been in a band? Mm -hmm. One hand went up. Seriously? Yeah. Wow, and interesting. So, so one of the first things I did with them was critical listening and just breaking apart certain songs and, you know, analyzing, you know, and Brilliant. saying, okay, so, you know, there's, listen to the way this, you know, listen to the way the tempo shifts here and there. Listen to the drummer playing off the bass player, playing off the keyboard player, you know, all of these different kind of aspects of music that I think in a certain way have been lost. And I think learning to play with other people is also part of developing that vocabulary mm. because a lot of what happens there is exactly what you're talking about. When you've played with somebody enough, it's nonverbal. Mm -hmm. It's completely just mental. You, you know, I, I had one particular drummer that I played with for many years in a band and, or in several bands actually, and we would literally get to the, to the point where we could just look at each other mm -hmm. and yeah, and we would both know, okay, next time this part comes around, we're going to do, you know, mm -hmm. and we would, again, you would have these happy accidents because you've developed that rapport. And I think that rapport is so important, and it goes way beyond the musical. Yes. And I think that really goes to even just the communication as human beings. The intuitive. Yeah. I yeah. think that there is no way to describe that feeling when you're playing and everybody starts playing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And you go, and and then you're you know you're playing with the beat, and then you come back, and everybody does it together, and it's spontaneous. You can only know that by doing it, and it's it's an undes indescribable, amazing feeling. It is. I in certain ways I liken it to falling in love, you know, and, and it's it's a different kind of love, yeah. obviously. But it's I have people that I have played with and had that kind of interplay with that we are we will remain close mm -hmm. as long as we're alive because we've had that kind of interaction. Yeah, it's so important. It's so amazing that you said that because I think about people I've played with over the years and that we've remained close to even though maybe we haven't seen each other for a long time. That's probably why. You have yeah. that connection that yeah. you this is a very soul connection. It is. It is. Yeah. It's a very soul connection. Very much so. It's it's um it goes so far beyond verbal, mm -hmm. and it's really, it, it's almost spiritual in a certain mm -hmm. sense. You know, yeah. there's this communication that comes from, I think, playing music together because music is so fundamental to the human condition. Mm -hmm. You know, and then if you if you really have this kind of relationship with someone, I think that never goes away. Yeah, and then as a composer what you can translate those feelings yeah. because really music is about emotion yes right yes it is emotion it is just mm -hmm. invisible emotion yeah yeah <laughs> exactly so oh, since we're, go ahead i want to tell you something um i wanted to mention something based on what you just were talking about the arsenio band and playing with people there was an element of spontaneity that I think people at home didn't realize was happening. <laughs> because it was during the commercial breaks? No, <laughs> no. Well, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, for instance, uh, there was one time where, well, oftentimes guests would just start singing. 
Uh -huh. That was not planned. They'd start singing and you'd start playing. <laughs> cool. You know, mm -hmm. and that was pretty cool and, and pretty spontaneous. And you had to really listen and be on your toes all the time. I remember one time the drummer and I were kind of playing around with Superstition because uh -huh. it was one of our bumper songs. And all of a sudden, out comes Stevie Wonder and, and <laughs> Whitney Houston, who were kind of hanging out in the back. And they came, and we all started jamming. And it turned into this big on-camera jam that I'll never forget. Wow. With Whitney uh -huh. and Stevie Wonder and all of us playing our version of Superstition, which we were all, you know, we were all just kind of playing off each other, and it was so amazing. And you're, and, and somewhere in the back of your mind, you're going, oh my God, I'm playing with Stevie Wonder, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Because, again, those are those moments that you can't prepare for. Yes. But yet, you've been preparing for them your whole life. And as you say, you know, the ability to be able to read everybody else and read the whole situation, I think that's so, that's so part of, I think, being a creative. Uh, that's what I love about being in music. That's what I love about being a musician is that those moments. Yeah. I think that to me is worth the price of admission. Right totally. There. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you because we're we're talking a little bit about younger people coming in. What would you tell 15-year-old you now? Oh. Just keep going. <laughs> I mean, it's a different world now. Yeah, it's obviously. a different world. You know, something that I have said to others really is that on that list of, you know, that sheet of paper, there's no <clears throat> bullet point or there's no place that you could just pin and say, okay, I've now achieved, because everything's changing. And so I just feel like the journey is as important as anything. It's more important. Yes. It is. And... And that there's really no there to actually get. <laughs> That's a very elusive place. And loving family, appreciating beauty, being able to do what you love is what's really important. Because if you get there and you're an asshole... <laughs> Or if you get there and you're just unhappy. Or you're not happy. Yeah. You know, so most assholes are unhappy, so it kind of goes together. And, and, you know, a lot of people that are unhappy have, have reasons in their past, too. Sure. That they've they've yeah. trauma and things that they've gone through. And so, you know, not to judge that, but doing what makes you happy is such a blessing. Yeah. And yeah. there's ways to find out what that is. For me... It took me on the composing route because I just love it so much. Mm -hmm. But I'm still playing the piano, and I love that. And um, I would just say to my 15-year-old self, it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. It's really going to be okay. You yeah. have to just trust yourself and listen to your voice. Listen to, the, what, listen to your gut. When, if, somebody, if something doesn't feel right, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's you can't re you can't regret anything because there's opportunities that are going to come along and you're going to blow it <laughs> or you're going to say no to it or whatever. And then you look back and you say, oh, if I would have only done that. Everyone's Forget got that. regrets. Forget but, yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. And I think, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that because you said earlier the whole idea of always being a step ahead, you know, and always thinking ahead of what's coming next and everything. And I think to a certain extent, yeah, you can plan some things. Mm -hmm. But for me, and I'm sure the same is true for you, when you're in the moment and you're doing one thing, you're still thinking about something else you want to do. When I was a musician and I first went into the studio, I was enamored with the person sitting behind the console. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn how to drive that. Right. You know? And once so I cool. learned how to drive that, I learned how to drive that while I'm watch while I'm watching producers. You know, I was fortunate enough to be able to watch over the shoulder of guys like Phil Ramone and Peter Asher and wow. you know, and great people to learn from. Exactly. And what I learned from watching them was the human rapport. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the understanding of how to, how to get those moments, how to capture those moments, how to create those moments, how to encourage that kind of, the juices flowing, so right. to speak, you know, that, that interchange. And I think that is something that, again, you can't learn. You can just, you hope you can prepare for it. Maybe the moment will come along and you'll blow it. <laughs> you know, that happens. Happens. Yeah, it's happened to all of us. Yes. And yet the times when you're not thinking about it, you know, the times when you're not really prepared and you're not thinking, oh, this is going to be my big moment. Mm -hmm. Those are the big moments. Yes, those are the big moments. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking to what you're saying, I was thinking about um, the duplicity in a way of how we realize music. Because if you're reading music and you're playing at the exact moment that you're reading, it, you're not it, present. You're, it's, you're, you have to look ahead. Yes. Because, yes. because if, you're, if you're looking at the note and playing it, it's too late. It's gone. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know? so, so in that way, and, and when you're playing with people, there's, there's this duplicity of just being fully solidly right there. And also thinking, okay, what's the next chord change? What's mm -hmm. the next? And, and in composing as but well. But not thinking. But not, not thinking, thinking. Not exactly. thinking. Exactly. You're almost intuiting it. You're mm -hmm. not really thinking exactly. about it. Exactly. Because if you are thinking about uh -huh. it, you're not present. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And with composition, I feel it's, it's the same. You're looking at the whole picture, but you're also shutting everything off, hopefully, so that you can let something from somewhere come in yeah. and flow that will hopefully be beyond what you have maybe thought. And you say, oh my gosh, how did I come up with that? That's really special. That didn't, that didn't come from me. That came from some ether where who knows. Yeah. Yeah. But you listen to some things. Don't you ever have that where you listen and you go, oh, how, you know, that, that's really cool. Same thing with songwriting, you know, mm -hmm. and I've written a few songs myself where I've, I've listened to them later on. I thought, how the hell did I come up with that? I didn't know where that line came from. Mm -hmm. this, you know, these, these are coming from the universe into us to be channeled right. somehow. But there is this, there is this presence, th this not presence like a ghost or anything, but this act of being present mm -hmm. and being open to whatever that inspiration is, that I think really all of us as creatives, we channel, and we channel it by letting go, by not trying too much. Yeah, that's, that's the balance. Yeah. How do you try so hard without trying? Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's a, that's, a, that's a life lesson. Though, it is, you know? it is. And I don't know how we learn that, but I think part of what you're talking about of really all those years of preparing, mm -hmm. that's what it's for. You know, if you start, if you talk about the whole left brain, right brain thing, the whole dichotomy there, we spend so much time being left brained, learning our instruments so that we can be right brained when the moment strikes <laughs> right. and just boom. How did I come up with that? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that is to me so much of what the creative process really is about. That magic. Yeah, exactly. It's magic. And it it's is. magic to, to people. Mm -hmm. They say, how can you do that? That's magic. Exactly. And by the way, get a real job. <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> Which none of us will ever well, do. No, I don't think so. <laughs> no one would have me. <laughs> you know, that's, and I think that's what's so wonderful about what we do. Just the idea that we're privileged to be able to do this and give this gift that we've been given to other people. I think that's, that makes it all worth it, doesn't it? I mean, can you imagine a world without music? God, no. I used to sit in my parents' uh, living room, and there was a bird's nest <laughs> in the fireplace, and I would just listen to the intervals that they were playing, singing, mm -hmm. and I would play them on the piano. They're perfect fourths, perfect fifths, just yeah. these unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then... My husband Jeff and I, we slowed down a raccoon one time. We, we had a <laughs> raccoon voice. They have fast little. Yeah, they when do. you slow it down, little chatters. Oh yeah. my gosh! Uh huh. It's beautiful. Like they're like they're singing. Uh huh. 
Yeah, and they are communicating. Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> that's funny. I never thought about slowing down a raccoon. Oh, yeah. Try it. Mm. It's really cool. Yeah, well, I try not to get too close to them, yes. actually. Yeah, they well, can be pretty nasty. Yes, but. they can. Mm -hmm. yeah. They ate some of my fish one time in a pond. Oh, man. <laughs> I know. They, oh. were, they were just... They, they weren't having it that I was trying to chase them away. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're stubborn little critters. Yes. yes. So you've been doing a lot of composing now. That's sort of your main gig these days, right? Right. So what's, what's currently on the, on the agenda for you? I'm, I'm really excited about a project that I just finished. My husband, Jeff Fair, who's also my writing partner, he and I scored it together. It's called The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery. And it's about a bookstore owner who has kind of a life transformation. It's the sweet, sweet story based on a New York Times bestseller. Uh -huh. And it has um, some great cast, Lucy Hale and, and uh, David Arquette, Christina Hendricks. Um, and Kunal Nayar is the star of it. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, it, it's very, <clears throat> I would say, Copeland-esque inspired musically. And it's one that's, of those, one of that's those. That's saying a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I take a lot of inspiration from him mm -hmm. as a composer because I've always loved gospel music and Americana music. And uh -huh. so my piano playing kind of reflects that sensibility. And this movie just kind of said, star, <laughs> put your hands down on the piano and play because this is, this is going to come straight. This is going to flow. I want you to put your hand yeah. on the keyboard. I want you to put your hand on the <laughs> But I was so, I'm so proud of the score. We recorded it with the symphony in Budapest mm -hmm. and some really wonderful soloists here, including my daughter who played solo violin on it oh. and some other, some other great, great players. And I'm just so, so proud of the score. It's, it's cinematic but it has intimate moments with the piano, and it's it's out on I think video on it was in the theaters um, last month or uh -huh. gosh what month are we in you know anyway it's been in the theaters and now it's coming in video on demand uh -huh. and then um, I'm really proud of it so so was this this was not your first time working with an orchestra though no 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 okay okay because that's a whole other set of challenges and I you know I'm I'm sitting here in in keyboard and MIDI kingdom <laughs> right here. So, you know, I know there's a you know, lot of... Japan. <laughs> yeah, but there are a lot of composers who really hardly ever touch a real orchestra mm -hmm. in that sense. So that's another whole conversation that's we can get into. That's another whole conversation. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, we didn't even talk about uh, Women Warriors, The Voices of Change, which was a really cool project that I was so blessed to be involved in. Tell me about um, it. We got a Grammy. Uh, uh -huh. This last year, it was a project, uh, the brainchild of Amy Anderson, who's a conductor and in New York, mm -hmm. uh, really, really talented, conductor, really, yes. really talented conductor, and had such a vision to try to amplify and bring light on women's history, kind mm -hmm. of throughout the ages. So she made a multimedia, uh, I guess you'd call it a concert, but it was a show too, and premiered at Lincoln Center. And it was just each. There was chapters, and it had a lot of social justice uh, chapters that weren't only women. There, there was a the Supreme Court decision, you know, for for marriage equality. Mm -hmm. There was the whole Parkland uh, gun violence, Parkland wow. situation, uh -huh. and then there was women throughout history. And so I worked on two chapters, and um, it, that was with a full orchestra too. And mm -hmm. it was really really cool and wonderful project. I mean, is it a, obviously it's a whole different set of challenges working with an orchestra, right? Aside from the fact that you got a whole bunch of people being paid scale and all that, yeah. Well, you know how you're talking about how you were learning to mix, mm -hmm. right? And you were watching it and it probably seemed overwhelming at first until maybe you realized, oh, each each channel is the yeah. same set yeah. of, of knobs. Once you learn about EQ or once you learn about you know, compression or... Yeah, the it's... term is autodidact. Okay. You learn something by watching. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I think that's so true of so many of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So orchestras, I think of it as a, in, in the same way. There, there may be 30 strings, but a violin, you, you know, I know what a violin can do. Right. I know what a cello can do, you know. Um, and, and I think of it as, as a band and as a whole, 
and it's I think of it as colors. And that's yeah, that's the interesting part right there because you know what a violin can do. Now, what about what five violins mm -hmm. can mm -hmm. do? You know, and then you think of that as an instrument, mm -hmm. even though it's five individuals. Exactly, it's an instrument, yes. and it's a color mm -hmm. within the entire orchestra. Yeah. And so I think you're right, especially, again, we go back to the whole idea of visuals. Right. Right, and visuals, I think, are so intertwined with music, and we don't realize that a lot of times, but they really are, because, it, you know, it's obviously it's different senses, but they really are so intertwined, and I think understanding that and being able to make that work, isn't that, isn't that a little bit? Now, is, is that more of a challenge with live orchestra? Well, the thing about an orchestra is you really can't con can't control it. <laughs> That's what I'm asking. Exactly. You know, yeah. You have to make sure that what you've written down on the page is very clear and is what you mean. Because it, unless you're conducting it, um, it's it's out there. But even if you are world. conducting it, how do you know, for example, if I'm the third violin? Do I really have that sense of what the composer had in mind? Because there are certain things, especially when you're talking about sheet music, mm -hmm. which, uh, <laughs> which, which my old friend uh, Ed Stasium refers to as fly shit. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You play something and it feels right and then you look at it. Yeah, yeah. And you say, oh my gosh, that looks hard. Yes. You know, or, or... But, but I think, again, there's so much of it that you can't communicate. Mm -hmm. in written form mm -hmm. and again you know it goes to that whole intuitive thing how do you make sure that that orchestra is interpreting your vision and are they or are they coming up with something that maybe you hadn't thought of the That's same way maybe better exactly you know yeah. well just like uh, every person in that orchestra is most likely put in a lot of time mm -hmm. and we put, hope put, put in a lot of <laughs> listening time too mm -hmm. And so they're bringing all that experience to your music, which yeah. is kind of cool. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. And then if you're clear with what you put on the page, and you can also leave some things open to interpretation. Well, and too. I think that's the best part. And, and, you know, again, we can go back to jazz. We can go back to jamming and everything. I think part of what was always interesting to me is I would come up with an idea for a song, but I would bring in musicians who I knew could contribute something mm -hmm. that I would not have thought of yes. to play. Yes, yes, that's know, so whether important. Whether it's just a, you know a, a keyboard player who's going to play a different inversion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than I would have thought of, right, changes the entire character, doesn't it? Totally does. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. And I think there again, you know, you have to trust to a certain extent that that communication, that nonverbal communication, is going to be there where that person will say, "Oh, I see you." Yeah, and will add something. Yeah. And it always comes down, it's, it's greater than the sum of the parts. So true. Yeah. I love that, greater than the sum of the parts. Isn't that what music's all about? That's what music's all about. Yeah, yeah. Star Parodi, thank you for being my guest. Ah, oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And mine as well. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for Insights and Sound.